All right, let's go ahead and get started, everybody. Uh, welcome back to the Dharma Doors. I'm MC Owens, and this is the San Francisco Dharma Collective. Um, tonight, we're going to read another sutta. Um, we are still going to be exploring the Majima Nikaya, the middle length discourses. We're moving on to a new section tonight. So just a quick recap, just to remind everybody. So this collection of suttas is a collection of about 150 different suttas. And it's divided into the first 50, the middle 50, and the final 50. We've covered most of the first 50. Then we moved on to the, the middle group of 50. And that group, number 50 through 60, basically, it was the group of suttas that was to the householders. So you'll remember that we read a, a bunch of different suttas, and it was all occasions where householders were either receiving teachings or getting converted and becoming members of the Sangha. Well, <clears throat> tonight, we're moving on to sutta number 61. And this is the beginning of the middle, or I'm sorry, we already did the first 10 of the middle 50. This is the beginning of the next set of 10, which are a group of suttas to the bhikkhus, to some monks. So we're moving into a different section where the teachings are going to be specifically directed towards renunciants. And tonight, the talk, or the part of the talk at least, is going to be about renunciation. So we're going to, you know, that's going to be one of the themes tonight. However, <clears throat> so Sutta number 61 is the Ambalatika Rahula Vada Sutta. The Sutta spoken to Rahula at Ambilatika. <laughs> now, if you don't know, and you probably do, but just in case, just in case there's somebody out there who doesn't know, this sutta is a sutta that the Buddha is going to be teaching to Rahul or Rahula. And Rahul or Rahula is the Buddha's son. So if you didn't know that, we need to have a little conversation about that because it's kind of very interesting. So, um, well, the first thing that we sort of should mention is the question of historicity or just the the question of history i got to tell you you know as a historian early buddhist history is very tricky <laughs> and it's tricky because you know there's just a lot of different sources a lot of different groups claiming to be <clears throat> like the original source and so let's just start with the general idea. So it is generally accepted among all schools of Buddhism that the Buddha had a child, had only one child, had a son, and the son's name was Rahul in, in the Pali language, Rahula in the Sanskrit pronunciation, and that's about where the agreement ends, <laughs> that everybody agrees that the Buddha had only one child, a son named Rahul. But there's some differences in terms of, well, for example, the traditional story, and this is the story that I would tell. This is like the classic story of Siddhartha, right? The, the story of the prince that left the home life. Well, according to that story, Rahu, the Buddha's son, was born the very day the Buddha decided to leave home. <clears throat> now, I've heard other versions of the story where Rahu was born maybe a week or two before the Buddha left, but the traditional account of the, of the Buddha leaving home is that he left home the very night his child was born. And it's also part of that tradition that 
when the Buddha heard that his son had been born, <clears throat> but he had already made the decision to leave, he supposedly said like something along the lines of Rahula Jatta, uh, ban Bandakam, what is it? Rahula Jatta, Bandanam Jatanam. Which means, so the Buddha, upon hearing that he had a child born, supposedly said, a Rahu has been born. A bondage has come into being. And so a Rahu, where the child will get its name, but the Buddha supposedly said that a Rahu has been born. Well, that's where we need to know that the word Rahu, not Rahul with a with like an L at the end, but just Rahu, <clears throat> that word means like a, an obstruction or a blockage. And you, if you've studied Buddhism or even maybe just kind of Indian culture, you may know that in Indian cosmology, so in, in the Indian astronomy, in addition to the various planets, there are two asuras. They are giant gods, but they take the form of planetary bodies. And there are two of these asuras. One is named Ketu and one is named Rahu. Ketu is the planetary body, it's the asura that moves in front of the sun when there's an eclipse. So in traditional Indian cosmology, it's not a matter of the sun and the earth being kind of in syzygy in that way. There's actually a, a new third body named Ketu that gets in the way. And when there's a lunar eclipse, there's an asura named Rahu that gets in the way, that blocks the moon. So a Rahu is a blockage or a blocker. And then the Buddha supposedly said, a Rahu has been born. <laughs> and then there's a debate about what exactly did the Buddha mean by that? Did he mean a blockage has been born? It would kind of seem like it because the second part of that sentence, bandhanam jatanam, means bondage has come into existence or bondage has arisen. So that would kind of seem to point at what they're referring to. But there's another tradition that says the Buddha named his child like a great asura, not like a problem, but just it was a very, very honorific title. Either way, the tradition, and so this is actually, I want to start like introducing the idea of historicity. We don't know, we don't know much historically in terms of Rahu, Rahu, the Buddha's son. We don't, we don't know much at all, but traditionally it is accepted that the Buddha saw the child as an obstacle or a, a hindrance to leaving home and becoming an ascetic and becoming enlightened. And so for that reason, name the child Rahul. All right. So that's the kind of general idea. But I want to tell you something. That story, which is kind of like the mainstream story of the Buddha's kid, that's only kind of one version of the story. And it's, you know, again, the main, mainly accepted one. <clears throat> but there's another it's kind of the more, um, it's not exactly Mahayana, but the Mahayana Buddhist tradition gets it from the Sarvastivadins. And the Sarvastivadins, specifically the Mula Sarvastivadins, they have a whole tradition that, <laughs> that Rahu, Rahul was conceived right before the Buddha left home, but wasn't born 
for six years afterwards, six and a half, seven years afterwards. And on the very night the Buddha got enlightened. Oh, we don't need to see that. Let's see. Go away. Sorry about that, everybody. So on the very night the Buddha got enlightened under the Bodhi tree, seven years later, Rahul was born. <laughs> After seven years? This supposedly raised some debate <laughs> that maybe Rahul wasn't actually the Buddha's child. So there was kind of like a... Uh, a Jerry Springer moment where there was a debate about who, whether the Buddha was really the, his father. It turned out that he was, but because of the Buddha's enlightenment, it kind of prolonged the gestation period or something. They they kind of have a mythological reason of why the birth waited you know so long. Either way, that story, the Sarvastivadin version. There's a way in which that one's actually older than the classically accepted one. But that would have to get into how we date things. And that's not what tonight's talk is about. But I just want you to know that there's different versions of the Rahul story. But everybody agrees. The Buddha definitely had a child, a son named Rahul. Now, for tonight's sutra... We need to know something very interesting, though. So I'm going to just be referring to the Tara, Taravadin, the classic story of Siddhartha now. But according to that story, when where the Buddha left home on the very like birthday, what that means is, is that traditionally, little Rahul was seven years old when the Buddha came back to the palace. So you might know the story or the kind of the basic story is, you know, the Buddha leaves, goes, wanders the forests alone, takes up with different teachers, eventually decides that those teachers are not really enlightened. He decides to go find enlightenment by, enlightenment by himself, becomes enlightened, gets a bunch of students, and then eventually... Siddhartha, now the Buddha, goes back to the palace, goes back to the family, and is successful in getting his wife, Yashodra. He successfully gets his um, kind of mother, although it's not his birth mother, but his aunt uh, Prajapati becomes the first nun. And little seven-year-old Rahula becomes a monk. Now, I will tell you that there's another version of the story where little Rahul becomes a monk when he's nine years old. There's even another version where he's even a little older than that. My guess would be that if you didn't know this, there's a part of the modern rules of Buddhism, and these are old rules, but they're relatively modern. There's a rule that you kind of need to be a novice monk for two years until you become a full monk. My presumption is, is that they wanted Rahula to observe all the rules. And so, yes, he became a novice when he was seven. And then two years later, he got fully ordained. Another interesting thing about little Rahul, though, even though the Buddha at the time that Rahul had become part of the Sangha, even though little Rahul was joining the Sangha that consisted of a lot of the famous monks that we know and, and a bunch of you know nuns and all of that, there's a kind of a, a story of, or a thing about little Rahul the lore is that he was the first person to receive official ordination. And by official, what I mean is, is that there is a very formal, official way of taking refuge. And it's taking refuge in what is called the three jewels 
Rules or the Triple Gem, the Buddha Dharma Sangha. And you basically say, I state your name, take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. And you basically say that three times and you're in. <laughs> Different groups, it's more complicated it's different language, but that's the general idea of taking refuge in the world today. And according to Buddhist tradition, Rahul or Rahula was the first person to do it that way. Everybody else just, or, you know, like a Shariputra or whoever, they just sort of seems to have just started following the Buddha. And so they just became part of the Sangha. But Rahul marks this sort of formal entry into the group. Now, I'm giving you this very long backstory to this because it's very interesting to, um, to know that the sutra that we're going to be reading tonight, and I'll read this in a moment, this sutra is traditionally being taught to the seven-year-old Rahul or the nine-year-old or the, I think he's or 11 years old. So one tradition, he's seven. In one tradition, he's nine. In another, he's 11. But either way, he's very young. So here's the thing. Next week, I want to read sutta number 62, the next sutta. Also a Rahula sutta. It's also a teaching given to Rahula. Except that sutta, Rahul is traditionally like 18 years old. So that's interesting. But I wanted to start tonight with this one because I wanted to give you the background on Rahula, tell you kind of the, you know, the differing stories about him. But then I really wanted to start with this sutra. I think we should start with this sutra. Because there's a way in which this sutra is a preparatory sutra for next week's sutra. So just wanted to make that clear. Like there's going to be a connection between this week and next week. Otherwise, I think we can kind of dive into the text. Um, yeah, and I'll do this in parts as usual. We'll read the beginning, get us going. So here is the Ambilatika Rahula Vada Sutta, the advice or just the teachings given to Rahula at Ambilatika. Thus have I heard. On one occasion, the Blessed One was living at the Rajgaha in the bamboo grove, the squirrel's sanctuary. Now, on that occasion, the venerable little Rahula was living at Ambilatika. Then, when it was evening, the Blessed One rose from meditation and went to the venerable Rahula at Ambilatika. The venerable Rahula saw the Blessed One coming in the distance and made a seat ready and set out water for him for washing the feet. The Blessed One sat down on the seat made ready and washed his feet. The Venerable Rahula paid homage to him and sat down at one side. Then the Blessed One left a little bit of water in the water vessel and asked the Venerable Rahula, Rahula, do you see this little water left in the water vessel? Yes, Venerable Sir. Even so little, Rahula, is the reclusive of those who are not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie. Let's analyze that real quick so we understand the language that's being used, and then I'll read the rest of this section. So this sutra is called what is called, or in tradition, they call it an object lesson. And it's a very kind of interesting moment. You could call it upaya, but it's a very interesting moment where the Buddha uses a prop. He uses like a, a, a bowl in this, in this case. 
And what I kind of want us to know or th actually think about, I've noticed that in other sutras, even Mahayana sutras, I've noticed that when it's Rahul or Rahula, the Buddha often uses visual aids. And I find that that's interesting given the fact that this is supposed to be a little boy, right? It seems like a very appropriate teaching device in that way. And you might miss that if you think Rahula is just, you know, a monk like any other monk. Like if you didn't know the backstory that he's supposed to be a little boy and not only any little boy, he's kind of the Buddha's boy in that sense, even though, of course, he is renounced the family life in that way. So the first thing that's going on here is the Buddha is using this bowl and he's going to use it four different ways. Now, what he's going to be referring to is a, mona a monastic, a renunciant who deliberately tells a lie. All right. So if you, you know, if you didn't know that it was a lie, that's kind of one thing, but we're talking about deliberately telling a lie and actually not being ashamed to deliberately tell a lie, like seeing no problem with it. So the Buddha is going to use this bowl to describe the, the, the level of commitment of someone who tells a deliberate lie without shame. And what he's going to be referring to is like in this, the first one, the little bit of water, that little bit of water, right, is the, is the little bit of reclusion that the person would have who wouldn't have any shame in telling a lie. So what we're talking about is sort of like, I would just basically put it simply as a, a level of commitment in that way. How committed are you to renunciation? And that's where I want to pause and I want to remind everybody that we are now in the section where the Buddha is talking to people who have renounced. And I know that you might not have renounced. I haven't renounced. I'm not a renunciant monastic in that way. But nonetheless, I think there's still a lot that we can get out of this, of course. There's going to be more teachings to come once we kind of get deeper into the sutta. But I do want us to just sort of like, you know... I want us to think about that the idea of um, of going all in, the idea of of re like renouncing, becoming a nun or becoming a monk, but that idea of like full like I'm in all the way. So the Buddha is talking about somebody who's made that decision to go all in. And now he's saying that somebody who's renounced, but they still would have no shame in telling a lie. Well, then that person's renunciation, it's like that little bit of water, right? But then the blessed one threw away the little bit of water that was left and asked the venerable Rahula, Rahula, do you see that little bit of water that was thrown away? Yes, venerable sir. Even so, Rahula, those who are not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie have thrown away their recluse ship. They've tossed it out the window. Then the Blessed One turned the water vessel upside down and asked the venerable Rahula, Rahula, do you see this water vessel turned upside down? Yes, venerable sir. Even so, Rahula, those who are not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie have turned their recluse ship upside down. Then the blessed one turned the water vessel right way up 
and ask the venerable Rahula, Rahula, do you see this hollow, empty water vessel? Yes, venerable sir. Even so, hollow and empty, Rahula, is the recluseship of those who are not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie. All right, so that's the Buddha's four bowls example. But then he goes in section seven, he goes on to use a kind of a recapping analogy of an elephant tusker, a kind of a warrior elephant with these giant tusks, right? And he says, suppose Rahula, that there was a royal tusker elephant with tusks as long as chariot poles, full grown in stature, high bred and accustomed to battle. In battle, the elephant would perform his task with his fore feet and his hind feet, with his fore quarters and his hind quarters, with his head and his ears, with his tusks and his tail. Yet he would keep back his trunk. Then his rider would think, this royal tusker elephant with tusks as long as chariot poles performs his task in battle with his fore feet and his hind feet yet he keeps back his trunk. He's not yet given up his life. But when the royal tusker elephant performs his task in battle with his forefeet and his hind feet, with his forequarters and his hindquarters, with his head and his ears, with his tusk and his tail, and also with his trunk, then his rider would think, this royal tusker elephant with tusks as long as chariot poles performs his task in battle with his forefeet and his hind feet, and also with his trunk. He's given up his life. Now there is nothing this royal tusker would not do. So too, Rahula, when one is not ashamed to tell a deliberate lie, there is no evil, I say, that one would not do. Therefore, Rahula, you should train thus. I will not utter a falsehood, even as a joke. All right. So that's the first part of the sutra. So this is specifically, of course, about lying, about telling falsehood. Again, I would like to stress that it it's not just about telling falsehood, but it's about having no shame in telling a falsehood. There's kind of a big difference there. There's a difference between being like, I really shouldn't lie. Oh, but I did. Versus being like, what's the big deal? Who cares? There's a big difference between those. And so the Buddha here is talking about somebody that doesn't see it as a big deal in that way. So, um, and then this analogy of the royal tusker, right? This person going, the, the elephant that's going all in. You know, this is a time when such things were, were prevalent in that way. I would, I would possibly suggest that, you know, you could think of um, Mr. Miyagi, right? In the Karate Kid. <laughs> Telling the young karate kid, Daniel, you know, either you karate do or you karate do not. But there's no middle road. You're either all in or you're not in. I would take this as a kind of Mr. Miyagi moment in that way where the Buddha is basically saying that if you've really made this commitment to renunciation, then not even as a joke should you tell uh, a falsehood in that way. So. Okay, so that's like the, the entree, right? That's our, our kind of au revoir. That's our opening to the sutra. It's stating the theme. The theme is going to be kind of about morality. Everybody okay with that? I presume we don't have any. Now let's move to the next part. Interestingly, even though the Buddha doesn't actually pull out a mirror, there's still reference to a kind of 
physical object that's used as a, like a, well, as an upaya. So the Buddha in section eight says, what do you think, Rahula? What's the purpose of a mirror? For the purpose of reflection, venerable sir. And the Buddha says, so too, Rahula, an action of the body should be done after repeated reflection. An action of speech should be done after repeated reflection. An action by mind should be done after repeated reflection. Now, this word reflection, so it's very interesting because the Pachavekka or something like that in the Pali, I went looking like, well, what does that actually mean? And it's very interesting that this sort of idea of reflecting, you know, in English, in English, we say to reflect upon something, right? And it means to like, think about it. But the word reflection means to like, you know, bounce, like bounce around in that way, right? Well, interestingly, the original word that's being used here in the original language, the Pali language, when the Buddha says, what's a mirror used for Rahula? And Rahula says, oh, it's used for reflection. And that's meaning like reflection. And then the Buddha says, yeah, so too, an action of the body should be done after repeated reflection. So this is, we're going to, yeah, I'll, I'm going to get into just reading. There's a longer section I want to read, but I want to make clear everybody's sort of on the same page here. This is about to get into training, practice. This is deep practice here. And so what I want us to be thinking about is what does it mean to reflect upon? What, you know, well, think about what it means or even what it feels like to look in a mirror. And I don't mean that like existentially in terms of like looking at your own face. I mean, like, think about looking in a mirror. There's a certain amount of like, attention that goes to reflecting upon what's in the surface of a mirror. And the Buddha is suggesting that Rahula or the practitioner reflect upon actions of body, speech, and mind. For example, Rahula, when you wish to do an action with the body, you should reflect upon that same bodily action thus. Would this action that I wish to do with the body lead to my own affliction? Would it lead to the affliction of others? Would it lead to the afflictions of both myself and others? Is it an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results. When you reflect, if you know, this action that I wish to do with the body would lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both self and others, it's an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results, <laughs> then you should definitely not do such an action with the body. But when you reflect, if you know this action that I wish to do with the body would not lead to my own affliction, it wouldn't lead to the affliction of others, it wouldn't lead to the affliction of both myself and others. It is a wholesome bodily action with pleasant consequences, with pleasant results. 
then you may do such an action with the body. All right, so I'm going to read more longer, but I just want to make sure we're all clear. So what this one is, is about the future, future conditional in that sense, but it's about the future. And it's about an action that you are thinking about performing with the body. You're thinking about doing it. And the Buddha is suggesting that, well, before you do it, you should reflect upon that bodily action. And you should reflect upon whether it's afflictive. Are we okay with, at this point in Dharma doors, but are we okay with the idea of afflictive to self or to others or to both? Everybody okay with that idea? And really quick, I noticed there's a few things going on in the chat. Anything I should be aware of, Noe? That's okay. Okay. So as we go through this, by the way, I do want us to get like, like I do, I want to read this in its entirety. But again, I want to make sure we're all there. And what I mean is this is, specifically right now about a future action with the body that you are thinking about doing and reflecting upon whether it is unwholesome or wholesome. Is it going to cause trouble and afflictions for both self and other or not? And then basically the Buddha says to Rahula, if, if you say, if you feel like what you're about to do isn't going to be afflictive to self and others or both, then you can do it. That's a future action. So everybody okay with the idea of reflecting upon action, reflecting upon action of the body in the future? Well, keep reflecting. And what I mean by that is keep following along with this and keep reflecting. So also, Rahula, while you are doing an action with the body, you should reflect upon that same bodily action this way, thinking, does this action that I'm doing with the body lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both? Is it an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results? When you reflect, if you know this action that I'm doing right now with the body leads to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. It's an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results. Then you should suspend doing such a bodily action. But when you reflect, if you know this action that I'm doing with the body does not lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. It's a wholesome bodily action with pleasant consequences, with pleasant results. Then you may continue in such a bodily action. Also, Rahula, after you have done an action with the body, you should, reflect, you should reflect upon that same bodily action this way, thinking, did the action that I just did with my body lead to my own affliction? Did it lead to the affliction of others? Did it lead to the affliction of both myself and others? Was it an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results? When you reflect, if you know this action that I did in the past with the body, it led to my own affliction or it led to the affliction of others or you know that it led to the affliction of both self and others. It was an unwholesome bodily action with painful consequences, with painful results. If you know that, then you should confess such a bodily action. Reveal it. And lay it up, lay it open to a teacher or to your wise companions. Having confessed it, having revealed it, laid it open, 
you should undertake restraint from doing that in the future. But when you reflect, if you know this action that I did in the past with the body, it didn't lead to my own affliction. It didn't lead to the affliction of others. It didn't lead to the affliction of both myself or others. It was a wholesome bodily action with pleasant consequences, pleasant results. If that's the case, you can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome states. All right, I do, and I will in a moment, I, I, I want to do speech and I want to do the mind. I, I, want, I want to read all of those, but I also want to say something here before I do. And it's that last little part there. So this was about bodily actions that you're thinking about doing in the future, that you're presently doing, or that you've already done and reflecting upon them like, like a mirror, the Buddha says. And then doing all of this, and then if you've done something that afflicted others or what have you, confess it to a teacher, to your companions in the holy life. And then at the very end of this section, the Buddha says, you can abide happy and glad, if it was a good action, training day and night in wholesome states. So I just wanted to focus on that last line, that idea of training day and night, because I kind of wanted to emphasize tonight that certainly if you are a renunciant, certainly if you are a, a monastic in that sense, the idea is, is that you have taken up the training, but for life, meaning your whole life is about it now. Remember, that's sort of what the whole uh, Tusker elephant uh, analogy was about, right? It's about being totally in with this project in that way. And what I kind of want to emphasize is that, well, this so far, it doesn't have anything to do with meditation. This has to do with reflecting upon bodily actions, and we're going to talk about reflecting upon vocal actions and mental actions. But my point is, or what I'm kind of getting around to, next week, the sutra that we're going to read is a very profound meditation sutra. But the idea in Buddhism is that you can't actually even do this stuff you can't or you really can't get anything out of the meditation unless you are training day and night in wholesome states or this idea of wholesome behavior so as we move through these let's again let's continue to reflect this gets deep if you if you play along <laughs> this can get deep so Next up, Rahula, when you wish to do an action by speech, you should reflect upon that same speech act thus. Would this action, <clears throat> excuse me, would this action that I wish to do with my voice lead to my own affliction? Would it lead to the affliction of others? Would it lead to the affliction of both self and others? Is it an unwholesome speech act with painful consequences, with painful results? When you reflect, if you know this action that I wish to do with my voice, it's going to lead to my own affliction, or you know it will lead to the affliction of others or the affliction of both self and others, it's an unwholesome speech act with painful consequences, with painful results, then you should definitely not do 
such an action with your voice. But when you reflect, if you know this action that I wish to do with my voice, it will not lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. Then it's a wholesome speech act with pleasant consequences, with pleasant results. Then you may do such an action with your speech or with your voice. Also, Rahula, while you are doing an action with your voice, you should reflect upon that same speech act thus. Does this action that I'm doing with my speech, is it leading to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both? Is it an unwholesome speech act with painful consequences, with painful results. When you reflect, if you know this action that I'm doing with my voice is leading to my own affliction, or it's leading to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both, then it's an unwholesome speech act with painful consequences, with painful results. If you know that, then you should suspend such speech action. But when you reflect, if you know, this action that I'm doing right now with my voice, it doesn't lead to my own affliction. It doesn't lead to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both. It's a wholesome speech act with pleasant consequences, with pleasant results. Then Rahula, you may continue in such a speech act. Also Rahula, after you have done an action with your voice, you should reflect upon that same speech act this way. Did this action that I did with my speech lead to my own affliction? Did it lead to the affliction of others? Did it lead to the affliction of both self and others? Was it an unwholesome speech act with painful consequences, with painful results? When you reflect that way, if you know this action that I did with my speech, it led to my own affliction, or it led to the affliction of others, or it led to the affliction of both myself and others. It was an unwholesome speech act with painful consequences, with painful results. If that's the case, then you should confess such a speech act, reveal it, Lay it open to a teacher or to your wise companions in the holy life. Having confessed it, revealed it, laid it open, you should undertake restraint in the future. But when you reflect, if you know, this action that I did with my speech, it didn't lead to my own affliction. It didn't lead to the affliction of others. It didn't lead to the affliction of myself or others. It was a wholesome speech act with pleasant consequences and pleasant results. If that's the case, you can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome states. And Rahula, when you wish to do an action by the mind, you're thinking about splitting the atom and creating a tremendous amount of energy, let's say. So when you're thinking about doing an action with your mind, you should reflect upon that same mind act and rethink about it this way. Would this action that I want to do with my mind lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both self and others? Is it an unwholesome mental act with painful consequences, with painful results? When you reflect that way, if you know this action that I want to do with my mind, it will lead to my own affliction, or it will lead to the affliction of others, or to the affliction of both self and others. It is an unwholesome mental action with painful consequences, with painful results. 
Rahula, then you should definitely not do such an action with the mind. But when you reflect, if you know this action that I'm thinking about doing with my mind, it won't lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both myself and others. It's a wholesome mental action with pleasant consequences, with pleasant results. Then Rahula, you may do such an action with the mind. Also Rahula, while you're doing an action with the mind, you should reflect upon that same mental action this way, thinking, does this action that I am currently doing with my mind lead to my own affliction or to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both self and others? Is it an unwholesome mental action with painful consequences, with painful results? When you reflect that way, if you know this action that I'm doing right now with my mind is leading to my own affliction, it's leading to the affliction of others, or it's leading to the affliction of both myself and others. It's an unwholesome mental action with painful consequences and painful results. If you know that, Rahula, then you should suspend such mental action. But when you reflect, if you know, this action that I'm doing right now with my mind, it doesn't lead to my own affliction or it doesn't lead to the affliction of others, or it doesn't lead to the affliction of both myself and others. It's a wholesome mental action with pleasant consequences, with pleasant results. Then Rahula, if that's the case, you may continue with such mental action. Also Rahula, after you have done an action with the mind, you should reflect upon that same mental action this way. Did this action that I did with my mind lead to my own affliction? Did it lead to the affliction of others? Did it lead to the affliction of both myself and others? Was it an unwholesome mental action with painful consequences, with painful results? When you reflect that way, if you know, this action that I did with my mind, it led to my own affliction, or you know that it led to the affliction of others or to the affliction of both, it was an unwholesome mental action with painful consequences and painful results. Then you should confess such a mental action, reveal it, lay it open to a teacher or to your wise companions in the holy path. Having confessed it, revealed it, and laid it open, you should undertake restraint in the future. But when you reflect, if you know this action that I did with my mind, it didn't lead to my own affliction. It didn't lead to the affliction of others. It didn't lead to the affliction of both self or others. It was a wholesome mental action with pleasant consequences, pleasant results. Then Rahula, if that's the case, you can abide happy and glad, training day and night in wholesome states. Rahula, whatever recluses and Brahmins in the past purified their bodily action, their verbal action, and their mental action, they all did so by repeatedly reflecting thus. Whatever recluses and Brahmins in the future will purify their bodily action, their verbal action, and their mental action, all will do so by repeatedly reflecting thus. And whatever recluses and Brahmins who are presently purifying their bodily action, their verbal action, and their mental action, all are doing so right now by repeatedly reflecting thus. Therefore, Rahula, you should train thus. We will purify our bodily action, our verbal action, and our mental action by repeatedly reflecting thus, or by repeatedly reflecting upon them. This is what the Blessed One said. The Venerable Rahula was satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. All right. 
So let's step back to the beginning and let's have a conversation about karma. Yeah, that's sort of what we're talking about, right? That's that word action. So you have kaya, kaya karma, right? Like bodily karma. You have vocal karma and you have mano karma. You have mind karma. And in terms of those three types of karma, you could be planning to do it in the future. You could be presently doing it. You could have done it. So you've got the three time periods in that way. So any questions about that? Any questions about the training day and night? Or thoughts about the training day and night? Yeah, Maria. It's more of just a quick comment that this, this is timely teaching for me because I've been thinking a lot about continuous practice and um, and um, Zen teachings around that. And um, I was listening to Norman Fisher talking about that. Um, and so mm -hmm. I think this is kind of, it feels like this is what we're ultimately leading to. Um, so. Hmm. Yeah, just that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, there's, well, yeah, there's, there's a lot that we could say about that. What I mean is, is about the idea of continuous practice. And certainly this is a sutra that's about continuous practice. But one of the things that I kind of wanted us to do tonight was I guess I wanted to ask this question or just could oppose this idea. And it's sort of about like, I guess I want to phrase it in terms of like, would you really need to be a monk or a nun or a renunciant to do this? Like, I don't, I don't know why that would be a requirement in terms of, reflecting upon one's actions and asking, is this causing frustration or is this causing anxiety? Is this causing tension? Is this causing affliction to myself or others in that way? Now, what might make it renunciatory is that th that level of reflection is hard work. <laughs> and if you, so if you were to really start doing 24 seven reflection on action, you'd probably be a renunciant in that way. You know, maybe not according to some traditions, but my point is I wanted to like introduce this as a kind of, you know, a sutra for bhikshus, a sutra for renunciants, but I wanted us to take a step back and ask do, but does that, is that necessary to, to understand the sutra? And in particular, what I'd like to get into, if anybody has any insights about this, but what I was really hoping everyone would sort of pick up on by doing the whole reading, it's one thing to reflect upon an action that you are presently doing with your body. It gets a little weirder or wilder when you are reflecting upon your speech as you are speaking, that itself can get a little wild. But then the idea of reflecting upon the very thoughts that you're having. What's doing the reflecting on the thoughts that are being had? You see what I'm saying there? Yeah, Maria, <laughs> any, any insights on that? Well, there's certainly uh, an implication of um, an effortless ability to practice mindfulness of mind. Um, and also this speaks to this feeling that I sometimes have I want to call it an out-of-body experience 
but that doesn't really capture it. It's more like this. It's more like being able to be mindful of things while I'm doing it. Like sometimes it feels like I, the words are coming out of my mouth and I'm reflecting on them as it's, as it's happening. And so that's a little bit trippy. Um, so. Mm -hmm. on, on that note, Maria, I would want to throw out there just a possibility, just a way of thinking. But, you know, Buddhism, we in, in the world of Buddhism, we use the language of buddhi, but let's remember that that word buddhi, it means waking up. And what we talk about in the world of Buddhism is being asleep, but not like nighttime asleep, but kind of moving through one's life in a very unreflective, automated, sleepy way. And so the idea of waking up is the awareness of awareness actually being aware of what you're doing, being aware of what you're saying and being aware of what you're thinking. And indeed, Maria, it can get almost sort of call it transcendent outer body or just sort of something. -y. So I hear you, but that's the idea is that normally we're kind of sort of asleep and just sort of, you know, action, reaction, action, reaction. So this is truly, and it's, you know, I think everybody gets, uh, I've been emphasizing training day and night, that idea of the training. And the idea is, is that because we are not trained to reflect, we are conditioned to act in that way. Any other thoughts about it? Yeah, Noe. Yes. Yeah, so it really does focus which we found in the previous chapters to, you know, uh, it's the here and now. Mm -hmm. And there's the practice is at where, and even that, right? But, you know, uh, my mind runs around and I go, I used to play video games and I close my eyes and there'd be a video game in my eyes and my brain would be doing this because of what I've been doing. So mm -hmm. learning, learning to be mindful, to use that expression, this mindfulness of this, is yeah, I, I'm not I'm not a renunciant, <laughs> but it yeah. does come up. Like, hmm, it, it, there there is that pause. Uh huh. Is you know, is this important to say? Is this important to do? There's always that moment because of the practice hmm. to give me pause. Hmm. I, I, you know, what is that one? What, uh, the, the the story why do we do this you know why do we do this to have a to have a, a, an appropriate response mm. Mm -hmm. to learn to have an appropriate response and that's to everything and even this thing so i just wanted to share that with the group and to to myself because i'm having a hard time with this because i because i just go i'm not a renunciant <laughs> but i but i really understand the four noble i under have a perception of the four noble truths and suffering mm -hmm. you know and so in the practice i love that thing in the practice it's like oh well how about now how about now that's all i had to say thank you thank you noe so noe mentioned um or within what noe men mentioned sort of I wanted to focus on the three different kinds of karma, body, speech, and mind. And I wanted to mention that, you know, the Buddha begins this sutra and he's talking to Rahula about lying, about not being ashamed to tell a straight out lie. And of course that's speech. So, you know, the, the specific topic in the beginning was about watch what you say you know, watch your speech. But then the sutra became about body, speech, and mind. But I did want us to kind of think about, you know, performing bodily actions that might be afflictive to self or others. Well, you know, those can be, you know, many, many things. I think we are, or at least the sutra is sort of 
probably thinking more about kind of violent actions that might be afflictive to others or to self with the body. But there's a variety of ways that we can use our body in afflictive ways. Yeah. And then there's using our voice in afflictive ways. And again, the sutras sort of focus primarily on lying. And, you know, there's a lot to be explored with lying. And what I mean by that is, is like, if you're really insightful, and when I say insightful, what I mean is vipassana, like if you're a real practitioner of vipassana, then train your insight and look at the idea of lying or deception. And what I kind of just want you to notice or just think about is the sort of, um, actually it's a, it's a line in a sutra. This was a, this is a saying that I had heard for a long time. And I only recently learned that it was the Buddha who said it. <laughs> the Buddha said, a liar only lies to themselves. And it's a really, really, it's so true. And the idea is, of course, because like there is a way you can look at like lying and there's a way in which like if I lie to you, if I were to say to you like whatever, uh, whatever, I just, you know, I have a, I, uh, say a lie to you. There's one way in which I'm sort of being deceitful about whatever it is I've told you. But at the same time, I've also been completely honest about me being a liar. <laughs> I, I, I put it just right out there in that way. And that's where if you look at lying, it's funny because it's like, what are you doing? <laughs> like what? And then what I mean by the Vipassana, it's what do you hope to gain from doing that? What does the self think it's going to gain from doing this lying? And the real insight, of course, is, oh, this is just going to create trouble for me. This is just going to create affliction for me. And there's a way in which if I lie to this person, I'm kind of causing them affliction, right? Because they might, you know, start thinking a certain way or getting all, you know, whatever. And then it turns out I'm not a doctor. And then they're like, wait, you said you were a doctor, right? So the Vipassana here regarding speech, specifically lying, it's sort of just sort of looking at the desire to do that. And asking, like, what, what exactly is going on there? But then there's the third level, the mind, the mental action. And it starts with this idea of basically planning to do something with your mind. Now, I made, if you caught it, I made, of course, the I inserted my little joke about putting your mind towards splitting the atom and creating a nuclear bomb. Like people had to decide to do that. <laughs> like it wasn't just like, whoops, we split the atom and created a tremendous amount of energy. No, it was years and years of a desire to create that amount of energy. Did anybody along the way reflect upon whether that was a great use of mental energy? Is this going to cause affliction? Now, that's an extreme example, of course. <laughs> like, I don't know if anybody out there is planning to create a huge, you know, weapon with your mental power. I would encourage you not to. But the idea here is, is that that first movement of the mind, the idea of um, actually, let me, I am curious. When, yeah, Rahula, when you wish to do an action by mind. And so I just wanted us to think about that idea of, of 
having or planning to use your mental energy in a certain way and asking yourself, would that be a great use of my mental energy? Would it cause affliction to self or others? Then there's the really wild one, the reflecting upon the current, present mental activity. And that one, of course, is probably one of the trickier ones because there's probably a way in which many of us can identify when we are presently having afflictive thoughts. But the Buddha's advice to Rahula of, yeah, and then just stop doing that then, that might be a, a little more difficult for some of us. Like we might be able to recognize that the thing that we're thinking about is causing us anxiety, but to stop thinking about it is sort of, how do I do that, Buddha? Well, that's why we are training in this. Because the idea is, is that we don't all immediately have that kind of mental control. Like I was saying a moment ago in response to Maria's comment, uh, for the most part, a lot of our activity is a, just conditional. We're just kind of along for the ride in that way. And so a lot of times our thinking, most of the time our thinking is sort of just happening and then this is suggesting that you could reflect upon that thinking and ultimately cultivate a technique or techniques for moving your attention to a non-afflicted thought <laughs> and staying there but that's part of the mind training is the ability to redirect your mind and the ability to stay directed on whatever it is you would like to have your mind directed upon. This is, again, the training in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition. It's why they call it mind training. Literally, our minds are like wild animals jumping all around, and there's a conditioning process. So I wanted to say a few words at the end here about reflecting upon past action of body, speech, and mind. And then this idea that if it's determined that a bodily or vocal or mental action that I performed caused affliction or caused harm or you know was a unwholesome action, then you have this recommendation of confession. And I know that, of course, with, you know, basically the Catholic Church and the role of confession in the Catholic Church, I know that confession can sound like religious -y, right? Like super religious -y in that way. But I always kind of like to inform everybody that the Buddha or Buddhism seems to have invented the process of confession and it actually seems as if the jesuits or at least some catholic group saw what the buddhists were doing and brought the practice of confession into the catholic tradition from the buddhists but what i want you to notice is that there's no priests so we're confessing to our friends we're confessing to our teacher. We're confessing to our peers. And I've, I've done Dharma talks in the past about this, so I, I won't do it now. But there is a whole world in the modern world, in the contemporary world, you know, there is a whole big discourse about what is called restorative justice. And restorative justice has a lot to do with confession and it wouldn't be called necessarily confession, but you may have heard, especially this is like after the, uh, this was really big after the Rwandan genocide in the 90s. There was a big movement to have these truth and reconciliation um, procedures. And the procedure was just to get the person to admit 
that they had done what they did. There, there wasn't punishment. It wasn't about punishment. It wasn't about anything like that, but it was about that these things need to be voiced. They need to be presented in that way, that there is a a reconciliation process that can only begin when these things have been recognized. So I would really, if you heard, if you heard this or you've heard this in Buddhism about confession, I would really strongly think about it from like a, like a deep psychology point of view, not a weird religious priest thing going on, like God and all of that. It's Buddhism is much more psychological than all of that. And it really recognizes that it is unhealthy to not vocalize these things. And it's very healthy to vocalize them. So that's the, the little bit about the, in terms of past actions, body, speech, and mind, reflecting upon them, realizing, ooh, I shouldn't have done that. Or, ooh, I shouldn't have said that. Or even, ooh, I shouldn't have thought that. Well, as a method of reconciliation, you could confess that in that way or whatever it might be. <laughs> Questions, comments about that last part about dealing with past actions and then this technique or process of, of uh, confession. Noe? Yes, it's, it's, it gives us the opportunity, you know, it, it's like this, uh, to modify. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I heard a long time ago, uh, you know, a couple of things, you know, a, 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 a lie is a whisper that gets louder and louder the further you get away from it. The, 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 the guilt, the shame. And so this thing of confession or this thing of modification that by verbalizing it to trusted friend or sangha that it really helps to move forward uh and not carry what we you know pilgrim's progress with the yep. billy pilgrim with his burden you know yep but it doesn't point to a, what i appreciate is that it doesn't point to the de a deity and I certainly appreciate that that is it is a psychology of like once i reflect upon it that, that let me can I modify it in a, in a in a in a honest way an honest way yep and yeah that's it <laughs> nice cool all right I just have one last little part to mention about the sutra so um this last little bit is it's kind of uh, dear to my heart. It's one of the a little aspect of the sutras that I love. Um, so what it is, so this very last part, and this is something, this is a kind of a, um, a format. I would even almost call it a trope that you see in other sutras. And it's this idea that whatever people that practiced in the past Whatever people who will practice in the future and whatever people who are practicing in the present, well, they'll do X, Y, and Z. And in, in this sutra, it's the Buddha saying that whatever recluses and Brahmins in the past who have purified their bodily, verbal, and mental action, they all did so by repeatedly reflecting thus. Cool. And then, of course, anybody in the future who is ever going to be purified, they're going to do it by reflecting this way. But my favorite little part of sutras, and this is the way that I read these things, I know. But when it says, and whatever recluses and Brahmins in the present who are purifying their bodily, verbal, and mental actions, they're all doing so by repeatedly reflecting thus. They're pointing it at us. We we are currently reflecting thus. Like that's, we read the sutra. So for me, that's like a beautiful way. It's like a kind of recursion. It's where like the reader gets engulfed in the sutra 
And it's sort of like, they're talking about me. <laughs> I'm the one reflecting upon my action in the present. And I love that about sutras. It, to me, it's almost mystical where you've been reading this sutra and then you realize it's it's basically saying, and anybody presently reading this sutra is reflecting upon their bodily, verbal, and mental action. And you're like, I'm presently reading this sutra. So I just love those aspects of the, of the literature, of the sutra, of the format. Uh, I think it's totally wonderful. Um, bada boom. I think that's it. I think we are ready for next week's sutra. So, unless there's any lingering questions, I think we'll call it a earlier night. <laughs>